Well, good evening, everyone. Oh, I am, I've been looking forward to being here tonight. Um, and Madam Council President, this is my first ISB gala also, but it will not be my last. I have thoroughly enjoyed it this evening, especially the verses and a couple of the quotes. <laughs> but I'm also especially delighted to be able to share a talk with my new best friend, <laughs> Miriam Ali. Thank, Thank you. you so much for letting me share this Thank time you. with you. I just want to say I'm honored to be here, that ISB invited me here today, and that they're honoring my father. Um, uh, I salam alaikum, and peace be unto you, everyone, and good evening. You know, I just want to say before I start, uh, that video, you know, the, the risk in doing these events for me, my father hasn't passed away long. You know, every time they show videos of him, I'm like, okay, let me keep the, know, let me keep the eyeballs dry. But that was a beautiful, beautiful video, and I just want to say, I don't know if you know this, but when they were doing the quotes, uh, the quote, uh, service is the rent we pay for our room, room in heaven, uh, that's, that's, he, in his grave site, there's a tombstone that's not, there's a, there's a stone that's not his tombstone. When that quote is there, and that last poem he did, uh, he wrote many years ago, and that is actually on his gravestone. So you guys picked out some perfect poetry. Um, also, you know, for me, it's so apropos that you're honoring him because I speak about my father in many different ways. Sometimes I go to colleges and talk about him as the activist in the civil rights movement, or I'm talking about him as a father. Um, but as I look at video footage of my dad over the years, you know, now you have YouTube, you can see it all at once. And I, I would look at this footage as a teenager, now at fi <coughs> 50, <coughs> 50. <coughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm looking at it now and I'm so amazed by the plethora of footage where he's talking about his religion. If he wasn't promoting the fight, he really, uh, is there Arabic word, Arabic word dawa, you know, meaning, you know, summons, call, invite. And he really did give so much dawah about Islam. So I'm holding these sheets of paper here because um, I, I have an agenda tonight. I, I really want to talk about him as the Muslim and what ISB is doing in, in with regards to spreading education to people and collaborating with other faiths. That is what he was about. Um, and he took every opportunity to do that. So forgive me for the paper, but I don't want to get off track. I really want to talk. I, I think he will want me to do that. So there's some points I really want to capture. So that's, that's why a daughter has paper talking about her dad. I just want to explain well, that Well, it quick. also, once you get to be <coughs> <laughs> then you... <laughs> You didn't even say, you didn't even give, at least I said 50. You didn't even, she didn't say anything. She just said, oh. I have to write everything down now. But listen, I want to say too that Maynard, my late husband Maynard and Muhammad Ali really liked yeah, each no. other a lot. Um, and I think it's because they both truly respected the other and admired the other for fighting the fight in their own way. Um, and I know Maynard admired Muhammad a great deal because both of them were interested in social justice. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Miriam, I want to ask you, uh, Maynard and, and Ali both love to talk and talk mm -hmm. and talk, <laughs> but usually there was something between the lines or between the words right. that was a lesson or that was something you could learn from. Right. So in the vein of that, I wanted to ask you about the fact that unlike most athletes, Ali unapologetically talks about his religious beliefs. Right. Why was this important to him? There are many reasons, and I'd like to talk about some of those. Um, one, you know, he came from Louisville, Kentucky, in the segregated South, and he saw the segregated fountains. Shout out to Louisville. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Islam gave him an understanding of why things were the way they were, in that when he came out and said he was a Muslim, you know, he, first he was looked at as, you know, against the American way. Yes. Um, but justice and inequality and oppression, Islam is against that. And as opposed to him, he wanted to give credit where credit was due. He wanted to say, what, what is the foundation and why do I feel the way I feel? And back then, he was in the nation Islam and they taught him love of self and who he was. And I do believe 
The nation was a necessary bridge to Islam. But most, even in the nation, most of the things he talked about uh, came from true Islam. So the, it, there's no inequality. The only inequality is in the eyes of God judging you based on your deeds when you meet God. You can't bring anything with you, your race, nothing. And in our faith, um, you know, God created us as tribes and nations to know each other. We're all descendants of Adam. And so he wanted people to know that. I'm just not standing up. Of course, I, I know it's wrong, and I, I grew up in the South, and we see the oppression and the mistreatment um, that African Americans at the time um, ha had to endure, but it was an Islamic, you know, um, foundation right. that inequality um, is not right. Another thing is the Vietnam War. You know, he, he, you know, we hear the word jihad. We heard that a lot after 9/11, and he actually described what that actually was. You Tell know, us back what then. Is that? Well, I'm, I'm going to speak in his words back at the time where he when he refused to go into the war, and they're calling him mm -hmm. a draft dodger. Um, you know, we don't fight in wars that aren't, that we're, we're not, def if we're defending ourselves in terms of being aggressed upon where we cannot be Muslim, you know, so in terms of terrorism, you know, the, the terrorists are able to be Muslim free in their country. There's no reason to do indiscriminate killing. So back in his day, that Vietnam War wasn't a war of God. It wasn't a war that was saying, Muslims, you can't be free. You know, it wasn't a war in self-defense. Hmm. And so... It was very important during that time for him to really get into what Islam taught in terms of that. And, you know, God blessed him to win a Supreme Court case and um, not go to the Vietnam War. the first War. thing he asked was, why am I right. going over there to kill these people? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, what have they done to and me? And it's so interesting. I was watching, uh, I was doing some research on that and, uh, for a speech, and uh, he... You know, there was a phrase, no Viet Cong ever called me Negro, you know. And right. really, actually, someone else had that. They, they attribute that quote to him, but actually he repeated it because he heard it. There was a brother in a march or a, 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 some type of a protest mm -hmm. that had that on a board. And, and it, that's the first, that's, the, that's where he got that from. So yeah. no one has ever called, no, no Viet Cong, Cong has he ever actually called didn't coin the that. N, the yeah, N, yeah, exactly, the he actually didn't coin that. Yeah, yeah. But um, another thing was just social responsibility. He mm -hmm. knew, you know, I have a microphone and this microphone is, is, is reaching nationally and internationally all over the world. And what is my social responsibility for having that platform? And in Islam, you know, he was really doing, like I said, doing dawah. He was propagating and explaining what, what is Islam was. And he just felt, I mean, you see now with Kaepernick and a lot of the athletes kneeling, um, for many, many years, you really didn't see that. You mm -hmm. know, you're, you're kind of trained in, in, in college sports and professional sports not to, you know, cause any waves. And, you know, you, you're just a sport athlete. Don't go off in the community doing protests. And I really do believe the fact that my father was who he was, they kind of um, cracked down on that, mm -hmm. that activism with athletes. We don't need any Muhammad Ali's. I really believe that. Um, so, so just that social responsibility, I think, I think that's another reason why he... And, mm -hmm. and plus, he, he always has always felt that you were supposed to have a purpose. Oh, most definitely. So his purpose was... Right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, because I, I, before this event, I just wanted to watch a bunch of videos on him, because for so many years he didn't speak with Parkinson's, and I've seen almost every, everything on him. Um, that was real funny, that clip with me and him. <laughs> he used to always, like, want to eat my food and then psych me out, and, you know. That was hilarious. But anyway, um, um, we were talking about purpose, though. Yeah, purpose. I'm mm -hmm. having a senior moment. I'm 50. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, I, I saw him in a, in some vid a video footage two nights ago where he said uh, when he was, you know, he was really solemn and saying, "I may be going to jail. I'm, I may not win this case." And he said, "It's interesting." He goes, "I'm mid here. I'm, I'm, I, I feel like I'm here for something bigger. I could just feel it." And I was like, wow, and I, I missed that before. And, and this was like something early. bigger than the heavyweight champion yeah, of the world. Yeah, but I'm just, but he, yeah. he wasn't even referring to that. And this mm. was during the Vietnam War. And he actually said, I feel like I'm here for something bigger. I could feel it. And I, I, I this was like, I, I was in my mother's belly at that time when, when he went to court. And I was 67, 66, 67, 68. So, yeah, for him to have that premonition, that was interesting. So he always did feel his purpose. Mm. And then he wanted to, he, he um, it, 
explained his religion because he wanted to define himself. You know, when you're a public figure, you, you get defined. Yeah. You know, you're un-American. No, I'm not un-American. I'm pro the First Amendment rights of my freedom of religion and speech. Um, you're a follower of the black Muslims. No, I'm a follower of God. You got to be a follower of everybody. I follow God. He was very quick. And I remember we had a conversation um, about this. I asked him, why was he so bold? And he says, corruption, oppression, discrimination of racism is bold. I have to be bolder. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a quote for you from his daughter. Um, <laughs> So he knew he had to be really strong with that right. because he can see the he could see the social condition and how how strong that wave was against justice. Did you have one more down there? That was it. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many people have been inspired by Ali. Can you share some of the experiences that you've had with your father that had a major impact on you? Oh boy, I can only do a fraction because there's so many. Um, I would say the first, the biggest one that stands out to me is his kindness. I, I think ironically, someone who boasted about his fights and predicted the rounds and called himself pretty, that really was just a strategy to get people in the seats at the boxing matches. He was so incredibly <laughs> different. Those of you who have met him or yes. been around him know that. Sweet. And watching him as his child, seeing, okay, he treated that homeless man exactly the way he treated that dignitary. Absolutely. People came to his home, he offered them food. Um, it's very interesting, one, this is, I, I didn't mean to say this, but I'm gonna just say it, because this is crazy. He had let this guy in the house one time, and this, this guy was like, he's nuts. And I said, Dad, you know, I know you're nice to everybody, but one of these days, you know, we might catch the brunt of you letting all these people in the house like this. Long story short, that guy ended up being a stalker. I had a stalker, like a real stalker to the point where I bought a 38. Oh my word. No, it was serious. And uh, I, you know, I told my dad, I told you this was gonna happen, but he had let this man in and fed him and the man got like infatuated with me and oh, it was crazy, but I digress. Um, <laughs> he was nice to everyone. He treated everyone so kind. A little story to show you his, well, this is gonna be in the charity section, but I'll say it now. He got pickpocketed for $5,000 back in the early 70s. Whoa. And his manager was really upset. Ali, I told you not to put all that money in your pocket. He was supposed to deposit the money and he didn't. And, and he said, that man, I got, I got robbed in, in the ghetto. That man needed that money. He could pay his oh. rent all year. You know, and that, that's, I was gonna tell that story when we talked about charity, but that's how he felt about giving, that's how he felt about people. Um, so I would say that is the biggest um, impact he's had. That story that you just mm -hmm. told reminds me of another story that I heard about him where he was driving in his Cadillac one day or whatever his big car was, and he passed a woman who had just been evicted by the sheriff, mm -hmm. and they had put all of oh, her man furniture and stuff in the street. Mm. Wow. And Muhammad Ali, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it, yeah. drove up and saw what was happening. Mm. And he got out of his car and he went over there and he picked up something, uh, a small table of whatever it was that belonged to that woman and he took it back into the house. He came back out and he got another piece. Oh. And pretty soon people around started taking the the, and the sheriffs just stood there and did nothing. I mean, they weren't gonna challenge Muhammad Ali, <laughs> wow. right? So they watched him take all those things wow. right back in that house and that woman went back in her home. Yes. That, that is kindness beautiful. too. And, and he got in the car and went on off without wow. looking for any applause or, yeah. or, or cameras or anything at all. Very so nice. bless his heart. And I'll just say another thing that, that, what he, that has impacted me is his admitting to his faults, mm. you know. Um, he, everyone reveres him, loves him, and you know he has so many fans around the world. And especially as a young adult, as I matured and got, became a woman, you know he would tell me about the wrong he had done and and the repentance he needed and the forgiveness he wanted to ask God for, and really talk to me about that. And I I don't know too many. Mm, I mean, maybe some, but a lot of my friends' fathers wouldn't make themselves that vulnerable to, to share with their kids the things that they had done. And he did that, and, and I just loved him for that. And he was always trying to study his faith the best he could, you know, always getting books and 
you're talking to scholars, and I just, you know, that, that was a great, great impact. And just, like I said, the charity, how, how he felt, what he felt about charity. I mean, I would visit different cities, Houston, LA, and, and someone would say, oh, your father helped us build this mosque. And I'm like, really? I go somewhere, your father helped us build this mosque. And I'm like, because it's a, a great blessing to build a, a masjid, a place of worship in our faith. And so just, and, and you know, it, it, got a, it got to a point where he gave so much away, he kind of went broke. He really, you know, he, he lost a lot of money. I would mm. say like, you know, in the 80s, he didn't have that much. And uh, after he lit the torch and just things started happening for him and he gained his wealth back and some people around him were saying, we did that for him. We, we helped him get back his money. And I'm thinking in our faith, you know, mm. when you give, you, you, when you give without, mm -hmm. when you, you know, in gratitude and just right. give for God, you, you, get, you, get, you get money threefold. And I felt like saying, no, 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 you didn't do that. He, Allah did that. You know, he gave so much to yes. people. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. speaking of the Olympics, that was yeah. really a night to remember that was because amazing. it was a secret. Nobody yeah, we didn't even know. Yeah, the kids who was didn't going know. to yep. light the torch. Yeah, right? it was amazing. And Maynard had been talking about it. it was yeah. like, Ooh. and then when he came out on that stage, yeah, it, it was, was amazing. like a roar I have never heard before. It's amazing that that was a pivotal moment in his life with Parkinson's because before that mm -hmm. moment, he was very kind of introverted about his PD. And uh, this stands for Parkinson's PD. He was very introverted, and he realized people still loved him with that disease. And he got very active in the Parkinson's community mm -hmm. and trying to understand his disease, his quality of life improved. The kids, we start learning more about it. So that both both uh, Olympics were really turning points in the 60s when he, 60s when he won the Olympics in Rome, oh, right, Italy. Right. Um, it, he was trying to face the champion, and in, in, in '96 he was ready to face Parkinson's head on. So I thought there was very those Olympic moments were kind of similar. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. If your father knew that you were coming here tonight, what do you think he would want you to say about him, other than that he was very pretty? <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, I'm going to keep this real simple. Okay. First of all, I think if he, if he wanted me to, if he, he would be been, well, crossed over here after and coming back. So I think he would, he would say, I want people People that admire all the things that I do, anything that they admire about me, any impacts I've made, it wasn't me, it was from God. It was a gift from God. It was, you know what I'm saying? Yes, um, yes. I, I think he would, he, would, he would be grateful for the opportunity to have done the things he did. I think, you know, he did those things in gratitude. Um, and, and that's what I think he would want people to know and not worship him too much. You know, it's not, you know, he wasn't a perfect person, but I understand why people admire him. I, I get it, and he gets it, but I think he would think that comes from a higher source, the creator. It does, it, it, he was chosen to do those things, um, and, and, you know, I think he would be very prayerful and hoping that whatever thing he didn't do right, he would be forgiven for, but, um, yeah. Is there one thing in particular that you think he gave to humanity. Well, I mean, a lot. I mean, I, I yeah, I think I, mean, I one, think one, what, if one you had to kind of try to boil, thing, no, not one, but boil it down to maybe. Um, I, I would think say that I would say because racism and oppression is so huge in this globe, knowing your worth, uh, no, knowing yeah. your worth as a human being across the board, anybody, anybody. Right. So. You know, whether you're Muslim, African-American, poor, whatever you are, knowing mm -hmm. your worth. And, you know, he really did believe, and he was able to give away so much. Like you say, you had the Cadillac and all that. He, he was able to give away so much because wealth, he really didn't define wealth as materialism. He would say, I can't take nothing this with me. I can't take cars, I can't take houses. I was looking at some video footage, another one, like a couple days ago. Poor little 12-year-old girl, he was in another country and his 12-year-old girl stood up and said, Muhammad Ali, she said, what are you gonna do after retirement? <laughs> My father goes, I'm glad you asked me that. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna get ready for God. Wow. And then he, saw, he goes, God don't care if I'm a real estate agent, if I'm training boxers, if I got money. He's gonna look at my deeds. And then he went on and gave a sermon, and the little girl's like, I'm only 12. <laughs> but 
but if you, I, th I should, it's on YouTube, but he just goes on. But really, he talks about the creator, and he goes, uh, see, this, see this glass? You think this glass created itself? If this glass didn't create itself, if that chair didn't create itself, you think the world's created? You know, he just goes in, and I'm like, boy, daddy was something else, well, man. You know, the, the Reverend Elijah tried to get him to be a minister. Yeah. In, well, in he, the... well, actually, he, he was ministering a little bit. That's how he got the Vietnam War. He was saying he, he wanted the minister right. exemption. Right. But he definitely, if he didn't have Parkinson's, he was still living. He would have his own masjid talking up a storm, I'm telling you. <laughs> he, he would. Bless us. Uh, you, I was talking earlier about how if he, if he um, wanted you to say something about him, what would it be? And I jokingly said, other than to say that he was very pretty. Pre <laughs> pretty, right. But speaking of pretty, um, Ali wrote a poem to Maynard, my oh, husband, wow. for his 56th birthday. Yeah, I want to hear this. Well, no, this is, that's, that, I'm going to, well, I'm going to tell Maynard's you. Poem. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, but they would write poems for each other, and they crazy. Both of them were very creative, and, and used that imagination, that creativity to solve problems. Right. You know, it wasn't just making poetry, mm -hmm. you know. At any rate, so he had, uh, he wrote Maynard a, um, a birthday poem, okay. and unfortunately, I couldn't find it before I came. Right. But he basically talked to most of it. You know, congratulated Maynard on meeting, you know, the grand old age of 56, and the rest of it was mostly talking about how pretty he was. <laughs> Ali, not Maynard. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when we had that big fight that you saw up on the screen with Muhammad Ali and Maynard, you know, that was a charity match. As a matter of fact, it was hosted by the Black Muslims of Atlanta to raise awareness for black businesses. But uh, in 1975, for that fight, Maynard decided to send Ali a poem. And um, he, he wrote it in the manner of, of Ali's style and, and cadence, or tried to anyway. But uh, he, I'm going to share a bit of that with you, if you don't mind, because it really did kind of show how much they played with each other and uh, how much fun they had together. So this was Maynard's Ode to Ali. The champ of the world will soon be in our city, and the fate that awaits him is not very pretty. <laughs> they tell me the champ is Muhammad Ali, but that's because he never fought me. They call him a heavyweight, but you know good and well when it comes to heavyweights, that's where I excel. My plan is together, my game is uptight. When I do my wow. thing, my form's out of sight. Wow. Dance like a butterfly, sting like a bee. <laughs> my fists are so fast that they'll dazzle Ali. <laughs> the champ may be strong, but he ain't all there if he thinks he can beat this dynamite mare. Wow. Liston was strong and Foreman was tough, but when you mess with the big M, the going is rough. If I decide to just have some fun, I'll flatten Ali in round number one. If I'm in a hurry and have to get through, I'll win by a knockout in round number two. <laughs> and this ain't no bragging, but listen to me. If he makes me mad, I'll take him out in three. I don't like to brag, but my game is so hip, I'll make Allie wish she had passed up this trip. Oh, that's cute. But I'll tell you this, and you better know it, I may not be a fighter, but I'm Don Shaw, a poet. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. So come and see it, the fight of the year. I'll face Ali's challenge with courage, not fear, because he might be a fighter, but I'll throw out this dare. He wouldn't survive for a week being mayor. Loved, I know he loved it. Well, let me tell you what he said afterwards. Y'all saw those trunks up mm -hmm. on the, on the uh, bulletin, right? And so afterwards, Ali said, those trunks he had saved him because he had them up so high, Ali told the reporters, I couldn't hit him low because you're not supposed to hit below the belt. So he, so he came with the trunks all the way up to his breast. Therefore, I couldn't hit him in any effective spots. And because he's so big, he's like a balloon. If I hit him, he might have popped. So he got the last he, word. He always has he that got last, last word. word. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you for oh, that. Uh, 
you know, we didn't, you, we all know so much about um, your father, but I just want to remind people that he did receive the Presidential Medal, nice. medal of Freedom from, from President Bush. And uh, one award that I think probably most people didn't know, because I didn't, and I thought I knew him, he got some Grammys. Did you know he got a Grammy yeah. for a, a yeah, um, I, I do for a cartoon that. that he did with some people, right. teaching children about vegetables or yeah, alphabets yeah, or something that. like that. Yeah, and uh, and and another uh, a Grammy he was on with someone, and he, he I mean another record he was on with someone and won a Grammy for that. So that man was definitely yeah. had all sorts of talents. Yeah. And when we were kings, well, he didn't produce it, but the film when we were kings got the Academy Award for best documentary. Was he in that? He was, when we were kings, about the was about the fight of Zaria Africa with oh, him yeah, right, and George right, right, Foreman. Right, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. So well, he, maybe maybe I was thinking about yeah. the Academy Award also. Yeah. But you briefly touched on his Parkinson's um, disease, and I really would like for you to talk a little bit more about that because for thirty years. Over he, 30 he, years. Over 30 years. When I first met him, he was, you know, all himself and right, everything. Right. And then the last time I saw him, he was still communicating, but it was with his eyes yeah. and his motions and his, yeah. you know, jabs and things like that. So you knew exactly what he was saying, right. even though he wasn't saying a word. Right. So talk to me about how he dealt yeah. with, especially I, the I last mean, years. I mean, I admire him incredibly, um, how he dealt with disease. It, it's amazing. Um, you know, my father, most people don't know, he was misdiagnosed for six years. He had Parkinson's in his second Leon Spinks fight. Whoa. Yes. Whoa. I, I saw the symptoms then, but it was verified. Some people did a study, researchers, re researchers did a study. Um, I forget, I think a, a, a university in Arizona, they did a speech study and they they looked at video footage from, from a, time, a certain time span and they saw the decline in his voice and slurring began in 78 when he did the Sphinx fight. And I remember 78, I said, something's wrong with daddy. Something's not, something's off. Um, and I had a debate with a family member for years and that's when I saw symptoms. And then actually I found on ESPN.com, there was an article about this study that these uh, researchers had done. So he did have symptoms and so he had symptoms in his 30s and he had Parkinson's for, he almost had Parkinson's as long as he, he didn't have it. Wow. Um, and he, but what's interesting about it, um, with disease and that hardship, if that's not a test, I can't tell you what is. And I remember we were at a party in Las Vegas, some like gathering in Las Vegas for him, and everyone was gone and we had a quiet moment. And I, and I said, you know, we were really open with each other and talked about a lot of stuff. And I said, Dad, I said, uh, if you didn't have Parkinson's, do you think you would be doing so well in your faith right now? Hmm. You know? He hesitated, <laughs> and he goes, I'd rather suffer now than in the hereafter. Wow. Now, I know that might sound weird to non-Muslims. I don't know if this is in other faiths, but in our faith, uh, hardships, not to say it's a punishment, but hardships are a test. You're te in our Quran, it says we're tested with poverty and wealth and illness and death. You're going to be tested and tried. And, and, and it also in our faith, it's, it, it teaches that some of Allah's beloved people are tested with the worst of tests. Mm -hmm. and, and illness and hardships are also, they're actually an opportunity for a great path of repentance. And that's just exactly the way he saw that. And, and people would come up to us all the time and say, in like sad eyes, which was annoying, but I understood it, are you okay? Is your father, how are you guys handling that? And they would be looking at me crazy. And, and so many people were like that and I got it. I was like, wait a minute, we're in p at peace with it because he is. Mm -hmm. He was even a leader and a, had a dynamic impact on his children or how we even perceived his disease. And he would always, another thing in our faith is, is look to who, there's always someone who's doing worse than you. Don't look at the people. He would say, I'm not in any pain. I could have cancer. I could be on morphine. I could have, I have no pain with Parkinson's. The, you know, I can live with Parkinson's, you know. So he had his rough times with it, but it wasn't so rough where it, it put him in a depression. That faith in God's plan was a through line even throughout that disease. And, and so if the family could handle it because he could, and he really taught us, 
you know, how to deal with that. And also, you never are supposed to, as a Muslim, complain about a hardship or, 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 or ask God, why me? It, you, it just is, it, it's, that's it, and you, you need to find out what does this mean and how do I pass this test and how do I maintain faith in, despite this. And um, I don't think that's something he studied. That was in, in, inherently in him to be that way and perceive that Parkinson's that way. So, um, you know, just beautiful the way he handled that. It, it really, really was. And uh, if I ever, God forbid, get anything, you know, I mean, I wouldn't know how to handle it. But he really was graceful in the way he dealt with that. And, and you know, we opened up with a poem. You did a poem. And I want to do a poem about how he dealt with Parkinson's. I wrote this poem in 2012, and I actually did it for the Parkinson Unity Walk in Central Park. It's a huge grassroots Parkinson's event, great for people with PD and caregivers to go to this event. And I actually recited it to him first. I wanted him to hear it, um, and he loved it. You know, he, I, I recited it to him, and he goes, that's good, you wrote that? And I was like, yeah, I wrote it. And he's like, you get that from me. Uh, that sounds like <laughs> Always him. taking credit. OK, Dad, you're right. Um, no, but he, you know, he, he where, ooh, ooh, did I, where is the poem? Oh, anyway, um, I used to have it memorized, but I'm 50 now, so my memory, no, he's joking. <laughs> so anyway, I recited it to him. He loved it. And I kept it in present tense. So it's in present tense, but I would love to share it with you. It's about a minute long, but it's called Pearl. What a hero he is to me, but more so heroic in the face of adversity. Lightning speed within square rings turned into slow imbalances while praying for nights like yesteryear spotlight on the Ali shuffle. The rope -a dope fight is now a rope -a dopamine battle. Parkinson's, akin to traversing upstream in a canoe with a leaking hole without a paddle. Yes, it is a struggle. But what I admire about my father is his determination not to let symptoms defeat his soul, refusing Parkinson's to retreat him into darkness, taking its toll. Throughout disease phases, he maintained divine praises to his creator, and I witnessed in the early stages his ability to still raise his once powerful fists despite recurrent shaking. That shaking. Reminds me of a famous Cassius Clay quote after Sonny Liston choked. I shook up the world. Yes, Dad, you are a pearl. Embedded in the oyster of life, protected by your faith and elevated through social strife, standing up for the right to be the man you manifested, politically unrested, you tested all waters until the tides waved your way to whisper in your ears and say, you know God's humanity. Now you stand with a walker, no vanity. Now a softer talker if you talk at all. But what remains the same is your spiritual stance, a presence remaining tall. I am so inspired that you chose to live your life to the fullest it can be, over 30 years of PD riding heavily on your back. From your earliest days to your latest, you haven't wavered your love of self and your eyes still sparkle like the first day you proclaimed, Allah is the greatest. Woo! Thank you. <laughs> I can't think of a better note to close on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a good <laughs>